Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Thank you for filling out that uh, post-class assessment. And again, I would like to have, if it works out, a uh, week from today, a uh, kind of celebration, as it were, um, a potluck barbecue, have a poolside, feel free to bring your swimming stuff, uh, you, your, your immediate family, just uh, sign up there. Um, you can send me an email, and I'll send you the Google Doc uh, link back, um, or if you want to copy that Google, Google link, you could but uh, would like to hear back from you. So we're gonna go ahead and start with questions. We might zoom through these pretty quick. We're a little bit behind, and I know Gabe's already started on Zoom. So let's just go around the room. If you just start off with Justine, could you read the question and then give us the answer? Okay, very true, that's exactly, very, exactly right. It's how we're born, it's how we come to the world. Tonight, go ahead. true that's right what did he what did jesus say on the cross it is finished right people say why aren't we sacrificing animals anymore why isn't there still a sacrifice to be made but jesus said it's finished he's the final lamb takes away the sin of the world good matt Yeah, it's true. Most people don't feel very near to God at all, okay? Um, and so this is, uh, this is the reality of what Scripture teaches. You have full rights, uh, even to the point of calling him Abba, which means Daddy. Good. Natalie, could you help us out with this one? Uh, compare the bronze altar and the tabernacle and Jesus. The sacrifice was to be from the herd of flock, the herd and flocks. No. Going to help out, Brittany? No? Oh. Sound like you're on the verge. I don't want to skip you. Remember what John the Baptist called Jesus when he first showed up? Close. Yeah, very good. This is Jesus is the Lamb of God. Very good. Good job. Okay, Jason, can you read this one for us? Start with the sacrifice was... Can you read below on the next one that there says a male? Right, he was a man, he was a male as well. Very good. Chris? Yeah, was, is sinless, right? Very good. Think you can do this, Abby? It's a little, a little complicated. You want to give it a shot? No? Okay, G, you want to take the next one? Very good. He died in our place. Very good. That's good. Christian? Very good. Good. This is our way to have forgiveness of sins, right? Atonement being what? It's just a covering, right? Jesus gives full forgiveness. Good. Andy? Yeah, he was the blood sacrifice for us for, as well, right? So why, why was there so much gore? Why did Jesus have to die like that? Okay, because that, that is the requirement. 
If you ever wonder how bad your sin is, look at the cross. That's how bad your sin really is. It takes nothing less than that. The blood sacrifice of the Son of God become a man. Good. All right, let's move through this. Uh, Veronica, can you do this one for us? You remember the tabernacle and the bronze altar? You remember this? Good, very good. That's right. First and only. That's right. Good. Okay, Preeti, can you do this one for us? Keep reading. If you read both, I didn't hear both. That's right. People wonder, how do people in the Old Testament get saved? How do they get right with God? It's the exact same way. It's by faith. There's no change. There's no difference. The difference is what they could see. They were looking forward. We look back. Very good. Okay. Kieran, you want to give this one a try? Let's think about that. The veil kept people out, right? But God tore it in two from top to bottom. So instead of staying out, what could people do? It's really an amazing thought when you think about it. The holy of holies, the perfect holy God. Anybody want to help Kieran out? Access, giving man access into the Holy of Holies. So what's the last one? What do you think, Jason? Okay, a way into the Holy of Holies that might enter boldly into God's presence. Very good, that's, that's good. That might get giving man entrance into the Holy of Holies. Again, there's a big, thick curtain. By the time they made the, the temple, it was as thick, of a, thick as a man's hand, the thick curtain itself. Reminds me of like Kevlar. How could you even shoot through it, let alone tear it in half, right? It's impossible. But God did say, look, now because of what my son has done, you, have, you can come boldly into my presence. Very good. Okay, this one's a little bit more difficult. Cameron, can you give this one a shot? Very good. Very good. That's exactly right. Turn and look. Right? That's it. That's what it means. 
You're going this way. You're going your own way. You're living your own life, doing your own thing. God's saying, turn back to me and look. Good. Okay, match the following tabernacle furniture with that object. Okay? Here we go. Lampstand. Confusion. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Which one's that? It's not lampstand, by the way. I said the wrong one. Janice? That's right. It's the gate. I started to get out of order, didn't I? Grace, how about this one? Good. Lampstand. Good. Can you do the last two for us, Larry? Good, good, very good. Good, good job. Okay, Justine, can you read this one for us, please? That's right, it is true, very good, very good. Good night. forever in, you said eternity, or, or heaven, that's right, very good, good, good job, Matt, how about this one? Yes, absolutely right, absolutely right, it's a common thing throughout the whole world, everyone hates death. And only Jesus gives that victory. He conquered sin and death. Good. This is, this is a challenging one. Natalie, can you give it a shot? Yeah, very good, very good. Searches and rescues. We have whole search and rescue teams, right? A lot of them are pretty busy probably up there in, in uh, Northern California. That's what Jesus did. Just like a lost shepherd searches and rescues for his lost, rescues his lost sheep. Jesus left heaven to rescue us. Good. How about this one, Brittany? I think 200 years ago in the southern United States. Can they deliver themselves? That's okay. Can you help? Can you help, uh, uh, Jason? This is a slave was chained. What do you think, Chris? So that's right, right? To slaves to Satan and sin, really. Helpless, unable, that's correct, without strength. Very good. Okay, I think we're going to skip this one, these two. Go to this one. Gia, can you help us out with this one? Who, 
Go ahead and read it for us. Yeah, it really is. It really is, see. Very good. I mean, each one had their part, but really, it's all of ours because Jesus died for sin. Good. Good, good. Christian, you do this one for us? Nope. Something bigger than that. What do you got, Andy? Close. We have a two-sided coin. We have a problem, right? Hold on, Veronica. We have a two-sided coin. We have a sin problem on one side that we can't get rid of. And what do we need on the other side to be able to be in the presence of God? Do you remember, Christian? Okay, holiness. Good. There's another word. Andy? Righteousness, right? Perfection. We stole it away from Veronica. Veronica knew it, right? That's right. He gave it, took our sin. It's the biggest exchange in the whole world. Like I said, I'm in procurement. I deal with salespeople all day long. It's the worst deal. You would never make this deal. This is how God loves. He takes our sin, takes it to the cross, and gives us his righteousness instead. It's incredible. The Bible clearly states that eternal life is a, excuse me while I'm checking in the Zoom room here, gift, reward, or wage. Which one do you think, Preeti? Okay, very good. That's right. It's a gift. Good. Kieran, could you do this one for us? That's right. It's not the size of your faith. You can have a great faith and a lie. But if you have great faith and a trustworthy person, in Christ, who cannot lie, then that's what's significant. Good. By something, we believe that Jesus died in our place for our sin. We believe that Jesus paid our sin debt. We believe that God's justice was satisfied by Jesus' death. We believe that God gives us the gift of eternal life. By what, Grace? By faith. Very good. Choose the reasons why Jesus died, Cameron. Our sin demanded death. Jesus had to die for his own sin. Jesus took the eternal consequences for our sin, of our sin upon himself. A and C. Very good. Very good. Good job. Again, we're getting a late start, so we're filling out our, our questionnaire. Thank you for the Zoom rooms back. And we'll start our, our last class today. So in the days immediately following uh, Jesus' resurrection, he spent actually a lot of time with his disciples. Uh, uh, and, and showed himself, as see, you see here in this verse, and showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So it wasn't like Jesus had a resurrection, appeared a couple times and left. He was actually with them for 40 days after he rose from the dead. In the end, Jesus took them back to a familiar ground uh, just two miles from Jerusalem. Then he led him out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. As they were still staring into the sky while he was going, going, suddenly two men in white clothing stood near them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. The angel said Jesus would come again. And if you were to study the Bible further, you'd see it has a lot to say about this event, this next major event in the biblical calendar. Just as God kept his promise regarding Jesus' first coming, you can be sure that God is going to keep his promise regarding Jesus' second coming. He, God always keeps his promises. Jesus is coming again. The rest of the Bible records the events surrounding the lives of the disciples who also became known as apostles. Apostles just means sent ones. These followers of Jesus told multitudes of people, a lot of people, about him. The word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in a large group 
of temple priests became obedient to the faith. Even priests, some of those ones who were probably instrumental in the death of Jesus, maybe some of the ones who saw that veil rip in two and it clicked with them as they saw that veil and later on they heard the gospel message of Jesus dying for sin and being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, even temple priests eventually became obedient to the faith, um, a large group of them. But not everyone was convinced. Just as the disciples had anticipated, there was going to be resistance. One particularly ardent Jesus hater was a young Pharisee. You remember the Pharisees? Well, there was a young one named Saul who murdered and imprisoned and tortured followers of Jesus. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing out threats to murder the Lord's disciples, went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus. As you can see from the map there, Damascus is to the northeast of Jerusalem, uh, just outside of the main area of Israel. So that, he found anyone, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, either men or women, he could bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he was going along, approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him Saul Saul why are you persecuting me so he said who are you Lord he replied I am Jesus whom you are persecuting this was the beginning of a remarkable life Saul changed radically he stopped killing believers and he became one himself the tables turned And the persecutor became the persecuted. On one occasion, he was stoned with rocks. So hard, he was left for dead. Three times, he'd been beaten with rods. Five times, he had been whipped. Three times, he'd been shipwrecked. And on one of those times, he spent a day and a night floating in the sea. All of this occurred as Saul wanted to tell others, about his own belief in Jesus as the promised Savior. Who is this Saul? Well, he's none other than Paul the Apostle, the one who wrote a significant amount of the New Testament. Over and over again, we've seen throughout scriptures that that God has asked thought-provoking questions. These questions were designed to expose and clarify a person's innermost thoughts. So the one being addressed could grapple with the reality of their their own issues. Saul, too, was confronted by God and asked the question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In a way, God was saying, Saul, why are you my enemy when you could be my friend? Saul's reply, reply revealed that he knew exactly who was quizzing him when he said, who are you, Lord? He knew it was the Lord. If we were so, to be so fortunate as to encounter God, you can't help but wonder if he'd also come to you with a question to begin the conversation. The likelihood of being confronted in the same way that Saul was is pretty remote. In, in all of Scripture, only a few people were confronted in this way. Even though we may not be confronted in person by God, we still have to face what God has presented to us as what's been recorded in the Bible. Through it, he asks us a question. Will you recognize and believe in Jesus as your own personal Savior, the only one who could pay for your sin debt, and will you receive him as your personal Lord and Savior? Don't answer that question without thought. Maybe you have been thinking of it. Maybe you have been thinking it through. On the other hand, maybe you need some time to think about that question. If you've been thinking about that and your answer is no, I I don't believe this message, I I don't trust Jesus as my only way to have my sins forgiven, then I'm going to be honest with you, a good chunk of the rest of the part of the class that we're going to go over right now, it's going to have a little relevance to you. You're welcome to listen, but there'll be more for you towards the end of the class. But what we're going to cover now is more for those who have accepted this message. The Bible says that if we reject the message of the cross, then you cannot understand the rest of the scriptures clearly or correctly. 
It is veiled only to those who are perishing, to those who don't accept the message. In their case, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the, the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the good news, or the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So on the other hand, if you're saying, yes, I would like to trust Jesus, yes, I believe that he paid my sin debt, and I want to receive him, and I do receive him as my personal Lord and Savior, turning from my, living my own life, going my own way, turning towards him and looking to him like the, the snake that was held up. It's turning and looking and trusting his payment alone and receiving him as Lord and Savior. The, the next information we're going to cover is of vital importance. It's, it's, it's for you. And really, the rest of the Bible is written for you. If, 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 if in all honesty you answered yes to these questions, then based on what the Bible says, you can rest assured that your sin is forgiven, that your relationship with God has been restored. You can, complete, you can have complete confidence that your certificate of debt has been paid in full. And when you were dead in your transgressions, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, I, I want to be clear on this. This is, this is something I think that people tend to struggle with, and they, and they say, well, I don't know if I feel forgiven. We'll talk about feelings in a second, but... Sometimes it takes an act of faith just to realize this first sentence. And when you're dead in your transgressions, no one wants to admit that they were dead to God. But that's what the Bible teaches. So at some point, you have to say, you know what? I'm going to take, not what I feel. I feel like I was alive to God. I feel like I'm a good person. And you say, no, you know what? The Bible says I was dead. So God, I take you at your word that I was dead and I was separated. And that's all of what we've been talking about these whole last 16 weeks, right? I've been separated by God, and I, I was dead. I had no right to you, and I was headed for hell. And I, and I say that, God, and I believe it, not because I feel it, because your word is true, and you don't lie. When you take that by faith, then the rest of this makes sense. Like Jesus said, the sick, the, the well have no need of a doctor, but the sick. I have not come, come to call the righteous or those who don't think that they need help. But sinners, ones who take my word and they go, you know what, that's me. I'm that sinner who is headed for hell. And now I realize that and I realize exactly what Jesus did for me. Then the rest of this is for you. You can know for sure because you, that verse that Jesus says, he was forgiven much, loves much. You will know that your debt before God has been fully paid. Why? Because you know that debt is yours and you know only Jesus could pay it. And he's saying, yes, when you receive me, I've paid your debt. You're paid in full. And not only that, you have, as you see there, the righteousness of Christ. Your sin debt was nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago because of your trust in him. God now says that your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. I mean, that's an incredible decree by an omniscient God who knows all things. He chooses to forget. He chooses to no longer remember the things you've done against him because his son is paid for and you've come to him and received him as your Lord and Savior. God's forgiveness is total. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love towards those who fear or respect him. Remember when we did that, that broad spectrum look at uh, where we're at and we're just these little dots on the dot and in the midst of a dot, Right? How high are the heavens above the earth? You can't even, I can't even measure it. They're still taking telescopes trying to find it. You can't find it. As far as the east is from the west, how far is the east from the west on a globe, a round ball? It's infinite. So far does he remove our transgressions from us. When you come to, to God through Christ, that's the kind of forgiveness. It's ultimate. It's complete. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? I like the way one person put it. He doesn't put a new suit on the man. He puts a new man in the suit. New things. All things have become new. 
Old things have passed away. Now, instead of eternal death and the lake of fire, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And if you receive this message and you're leaning on Jesus Christ and him alone for your sins, and you receive him as Lord and Savior, you do know the way now. He is the way. You do know where he's going, and you know how to get there. It's through him. As a believer, life still goes on. But now you're assured of your future destiny in heaven. Jesus says he is preparing a dwelling place for you. With confidence, you can now say that you're a citizen of heaven. Your relationship with God is now restored. You see, and this isn't pride because you did nothing to deserve it. All the thing you did to deserve it was realize you don't deserve it and you trusted Christ and received him. So it's not anything about self-righteousness. It's righteousness found in Christ. Just as you were once born into an earthly family, the Bible says you're now born into God's family. And just as you, are, as you had earthly parents, will always be your earthly parents regardless of what happens, so it is that once you are born into God's family, and that happens when you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you become part of God's family. You can't be unborn. Remember Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And when you're born again, you can't be unborn. It's important to understand that when it comes to your relationship with God, your eternal destiny is settled once for all. You belong to God's family for eternity. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As you think about that, even though you're part of God's family and there's a, there's a relationship, the Bible says that you will still sin. When that happens, there is a break in that family relationship, in, the, in that family dynamic, not in the relationship, but something else. It's called fellowship. Fellowship is different than relationship. For instance, if a son is asked by his father to go and mow the lawn, and instead the son just plays games on his computer all day, so when the dad gets home, things aren't going to be right. There will be a barrier between the father and the son, a barrier you can sense if you were there. It's true that the son and the dad are still related. Their relationship has not changed. They're still related. Their relationship has not changed. But the family fellowship has gone sour. However, the Bible has a solution. When we sin, we are told to acknowledge that fact to God. If we have wronged our fellow man, then we have to seek to be reconciled to that person as well. If we do that, God has, God has promised. It's 1 John 1, 9. I'm not sure why I didn't get it on my slides. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our fellowship with God will be immediately restored when we acknowledge our sin. In the same way, when you first came to Christ, realizing you were a sinner who deserved judgment and really hell, and you came into a relationship with God to restore fellowship with God, it's the same thing. You don't try to work and, and do things to undo the sin that you did. You could never do that to be saved in the first place. As a, as a child of God, you do the same thing. You say, God, I've sinned. It's wrong. And I know that Jesus died for that sin. And I don't want to do that anymore. I want to turn from that, and I want to turn towards you. I want to turn from going my way and look back 
to Jesus, knowing that he died for that sin. And that's why that verse in 1 John says, he is just and faithful to forgive us our sins. That's why he's just, because Jesus died for that sin, that sin, even the sin you do as a believer. So now as a child of God, you continue to acknowledge that same reality, that you're a sinner only accepted because of Christ, what Christ did on the cross. And it's that same concept of turning from it and turning towards him. So you see it there, that relationship is unbreakable. You've been born to God's family. You are eternally his child. But fellowship is, is breakable. Your sin breaks that, that pleasant harmony you have with your heavenly father. Okay? Any questions about that? Is that clear? You can never change who your parents are. Thankfully, that's true about spiritual things too. Maybe, maybe even more so. I guess you can disown your parents if you wanted to, but we won't get into all that. After hearing this presentation, uh, a man once said, I, I know that I'm a helpless sinner. Let me see something here. He said, I know that I'm a helpless sinner. Then he gave a brief overview of the Bible showing that he couldn't do anything good in himself to please God. Then he summarized with a clear explanation about his faith in Jesus and what Jesus had accomplished on the cross. Then he said, you know, fathers have sons. And just as I didn't do anything to become a member of God's family, neither does a son do anything to become a member of that family, of their own family. But now that he is a member, a son has responsibilities. He has responsibilities of what he's supposed to do in the home. So then he asked, as part of God's family, what are my responsibilities? What am I supposed to do? And it's a very perceptive question. One which the rest of the Bible answers. The scriptures say that the life a person lives is determined by the focus they maintain. You want to know what kind of life you're going to have? Look at what you're focused on. What you fix your attention on. It's not a mind game. It has to do with your center of attention. If you focus on yourself, you'll become self-centered. If you focus on God, you will find your life bringing him the honor and glory he deserves. Therefore, as being a a responsible believer in the the family of God, there's some things that, that God has for us. First of all, you need to focus on the new things you have in Jesus. And this is an eye chart. I'm sorry you can't read it. But it's actually just an incredible amount of blessings. Everything that you had, everything you didn't have without Christ, now what you have because of Christ. You have acceptance, no longer a slave, headed for heaven, not hell. Um, you're adopted. You can spend eternity with God, and you have eternal life. Okay, there's just a whole uh, just list of blessings. What you have now is referred to your position in Christ. God wants you to rejoice in the fact that your sin is forgiven and you have this new blessed life in him. And then then you need to focus on getting acquainted with Jesus. If you receive him for the first time as your personal Lord and Savior, like any relationship, you need to become acquainted with him. Paul wrote about this as a life ambition. He said this, But his life ambition was to count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, literally literally garbage, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, which we knew couldn't save us, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that that I may know him. You see, when you fix your attention on the Lord, you take your eyes off yourself, you'll become captivated with pleasing him. And and this is true about other aspects of life. We see this even in the area of romance. When a young man is with his girlfriend, he gets taken up with focusing on him, focusing on her and getting to know her better. Also, you need to focus on trusting him in your daily life situations. For you can have confidence that he is fully able to handle all your worries and all your concerns. Think about it. What was your biggest worry 
up to this point. No matter what you might have thought it was, what is it really? It's death and hell. That's the bottom line for every one of us. If God can provide a savior to save you from death and hell, he can figure out the next job situation. He can figure out the, the marital problem, the parenting problem, the, the housing problem, the job problem. He says this, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Yes, Brittany. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. Right, because we when we say trusting on ourselves, we're going to see for our human nature that's that's really, really uh, troublesome, right? The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We, we deceive ourselves, right? So how do we do that? So let me finish this, and then at the end, I think I want to address even more. So if we don't address it, what we, what we talk about, I'd like to come back to it. So don't let me forget, okay? Okay, cool. Good. So as you apply these truths, you'll find that you'll be growing. As you apply these truths of not focusing on yourself but focusing on the Lord and getting to know him better and, and entrusting him in these, in these situations. And we'll talk about the details of how to do that. You're going to find yourself growing, okay, from a spiritual Infant, a spiritual babe, into maturity. Should you begin uh, to think that you, you do this as a result of some super discipline you conjure up in yourself? Because that's not where it comes from. It's important to understand this. The, the, the Bible says this. He, that's the Lord, by his spirit, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's God. Once you receive him, he begins to work in your life. And he begins to draw you to himself and to work, as it were, like I said, from the inside out. It's not normal or, or healthy for a baby to remain as a baby. We call it, they call it a lack, of, a lack of, uh, of the ability to thrive, right? We want them to not just live. We want them to thrive and to grow. It's not right for a person either. In the spiritual realm, if they're a child of God, to remain a spiritual infant. Unfortunately, that's been too common for too many people. But it doesn't need to be that way. If we keep our focus in the proper place, we'll grow. But there are obstacles that, that get in the way. I want to just focus on some of these obstacles uh, briefly um, that will hinder you in your, your spiritual growth. One's human nature, as we we're just alluding to. If there was ever a case of being one's own worst enemy, this is it. The Bible says that our sinful human nature is never satisfied. It always wants more. More money, more attention, uh, a different personality, better looks, a nicer this, a greater that, uh, and it goes on and on. It may be satisfied with the moment, but our sinful nature, it, it's going to desire something more. It's this black hole of feelings and wants. Our human nature has one primary focus. What is it? Self. The scripture says this. If you live by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So how do we live by the Spirit? Again, it comes back to a matter of focus. As we focus on the things of God, the desires of the sinful nature are replaced with a stronger desire to please the one who's created us, and now the one who's recreated us and saved us. We are told to treat our sinful earthly nature as if it were dead. Starve it. Don't feed it to actively ignore its demands and its desires. The Bible literally says this, put to death, therefore, whatever, belong, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. For example, being a soldier means that one has a certain identity. You have a certain clothing you have to wear, fatigues. You have a certain haircut you have to have, a lifestyle all related to the military. 
While in the army, a soldier must obey his superiors. But when he leaves the military, he takes on a new identity, the identity of a civilian. He no longer is required to dress in a certain way. His former superiors have no say over his life. In the same way, before you believed, we, we were identified with Adam and had only our sinful earthly nature to satisfy. But now as a believer, we are identified with Christ and he wants us to focus on him, to focus on him and, uh, and serve others. Well, the Bible says, again, all over the place, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes or our focus on Jesus. You have to understand, see, the Bible, uh, we're, we're, um, we're accused of doing brainwashing here. Guilty as charged. Okay, we do brainwashing here all the time. Why? Because the brains need washing, right? The world teaches the exact opposite. The world says um, you need to delve into your past to search for answers and who for other people you can blame. Every wrong must be righted, and if you've been hurt, you're the victim, and you should be pitied. And the end result of all that worldly advice is a focus on ourself. We become self-obsessed. By contrast, the Bible tells us to forget about ourselves, including our past. If we, if we have truly been wrong, we're to forgive, as difficult as that may be. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. It may seem strange, but the process of forgiving others, in doing that, you actually experience healing in your own life. Jesus, who, who surely knew what it was meant to be wrong, said, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. The, the world system, so there's our, our human nature is one of our biggest obstacles. The next is the world system. The Bible says the world system has a negative impact our spirituality it shifts our focus from jesus to those things which are just fleeting which don't even last we're responsible to discern and and what tends to drag us back into the old sinful patterns and to avoid those things as they destroy our focus for the grace of god teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you see the Lord's coming back as a motivation throughout the New Testament. So besides our human nature and besides the world system, you have the third uh, obstacle, the third really enemy out there. And that's the devil himself. Even though Satan was defeated at the cross, he still actively tries to influence uh, people, uh, even tries to influence believers. God did not obliterate the devil when we, when we became believers. Rather, we are responsible to resist him. The Bible is very clear that we are responsible to resist him and his temptations, seeking God's strength alone. It very clearly says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit, it means obey what God's telling you to do. Resist the devil and draw near to God. You, there is no equal, there is no middle ground. It's a war. And you have to take that side. As, as a child of God, that, that's really your default. Satan cleverly uses the influence of the world and our self-centered human nature to tempt us to shift our focus uh, away from God onto anything else. You can expect him to plant doubt uh, in the mind, even about the choice of having believed. He might say something like, you haven't believed the right way or enough. Remember, he did that with Adam and Eve, too, questioning God's word. Resist the devil, just as Jesus did. Go to the Bible for help. As we overcome the influence of the, of the, of the world, our own human nature, the flesh, and the devil, you're going to start to maintain focus, and you're going to grow strong spiritual roots. And the Bible gives resources to help maintain focus. The first one is God himself. And I alluded to this earlier. When you, when you trust in Christ, when you've trusted in Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit entered into you, came into your life, literally resides in you, came to live in you. Now he's constantly accessible to encourage you, 
when you are downhearted, to urge you to earnestly live for him, to rebuke you when you start to drift into sin. The Holy Spirit is such a faithful companion, he is called the comforter, the helper, the counselor. And all of these are God's names. Jesus promised, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. As parents, we're delighted when our children achieve a set goal and behave themselves in a pleasing manner. As God's children, it's important that we conduct ourselves in a way that's going to bring honor to our Father and not disgrace his name. Our obedience shows we are giving God the proper esteem and respect, the focus he deserves. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things and because of your will, they existed and were created. After God himself coming inside uh, and to, to be really the power from within, also the, the resource given is faith. The process of growing spiritually is often referred to in scripture as walking with God. It occurs one step at a time. Just as, we, just as we became members of God's family by faith, so we are to walk with God by faith. Okay, so you come into the family of God trusting alone in what Jesus did, not in what you can do to save yourself. So also as you walk with God, it's not about your own personal efforts. It's trusting what God is going to do in your life and walking with him, following him. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, in other words, as you have first believed him by faith, so walk in him by faith, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Remember, faith is built on facts. The facts are found in the Bible. It's not important, it's, it's important not to walk with God based on the way you feel. You may get up in the morning and feel congested. You might be running a fever. That does not mean you're no longer a part of your parents' family, or for that matter, God's family. Sometimes you may not feel uh, very well spiritually, but that does not determine how well you are walking with God, not based on your feelings. Our walk each day is determined by our choices. If we make wise choices, choices that align to God's word, then we'll be, learn, we'll be growing in God's wisdom growing deeper spiritual roots. If we make foolish ones, we'll be demonstrating immaturity and we'll remain spiritual children. The choices we make are guided by God as we read the Bible. And that's the next, next resource is the Bible itself. It's our source of daily strength. It's our guidebook. All scripture is God-breathed. This is God-breathed. It's coming from him, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the Bible is compared itself to spiritual food. The more you study the Bible and the more you see it coming from God as your personal love letter of that day, the stronger you're going to become. God will speak to you through the Bible. It won't be audibly, but he's going to speak to you through his word into your heart, into your mind. It's one of the keys of developing your fellowship with God and, and deepening that, that fellowship and uh, in, in deepening that with him. Reading the scriptures is how you get to know him. Without its constant nourishment, you'll remain a spiritual baby. If you don't own a Bible, buy one. I would recommend a hard copy or an electronic one that you can write notes in. Begin by reading the Gospel of John, a lot of which we've covered. But now that you have the background, you can thoroughly read it. It reads like a story, and it's not difficult. After that, after that, read the book of Acts. You'll see how the church first began after Jesus left, and God used the apostles and Paul as he came along later. After that, read Romans. It really grounds you in the reality of the Gospel and a lot of the, the facts behind it. If you don't understand something that you're reading, keep reading. Don't give up. Ask God to make it clear, and eventually it'll come together. Prayer is another resource, and prayer is just talking to God. 
You don't need to bow your heads and close your eyes every time. If it's appropriate to do that, to not be distracted, then do that. But God knows your thoughts. He's, he's omniscient. He knows everything. You can silently voice your prayer to him at any time, and he's going to hear you. It's not necessary to pray out loud. So do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer is a way of expressing our concerns, our heartaches, our requests, our thankfulness to God, among other things. The Bible, God himself, prayer, faith, other believers, so important. The Bible tells us that we gain spiritual maturity through friendship with other believers. It's vital. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another, and all the more as, we, as you see the day, the day of Jesus' return, approaching most of your friendships with other believers will be built within the context of a church. However, there are cautions, and, and I say it not because I'm concerned about this church, which I'm not, but I do say it because we're being recorded for people on Zoom. Uh, you need to be careful about what church you choose. Remember, Satan prays himself as an angel of light. He loves religion. Because of that, you need to realize there are many false shepherds and false sheep out there. Just because people talk about God does not mean that they're true believers. Churches range from good to bad and their understanding and practice of the truth. The Bible says that both true and false teachers will exist until Jesus returns and he sorts it all out. Until then, you need to be asking these, these questions. Does the church believe that the Bible is the true inspired word of God without error in its original writings? Watch out for those who say it only contains God's word. Does the church believe the Bible literally, or does it teach it as, you know, fables or abstract stories? For example, the Bible tells us there's a little hell, a little devil, and a little heaven, etc. Do they doubt that? Do they teach against that? Does the church, does, does this church believe, uh, does the church believe in such events as Jesus' birth? Uh, by a virgin, or do they say it was a young woman and they deny the virgin birth of Christ? Does the church believe that Jesus is fully God as well as man? Be on guard for those who say Jesus was another God and that we are, that we are gods or that we can become gods. In the same way, avoid those who say Jesus was just a great teacher. Do they believe in the Trinity, as, we, as we've talked about? Does the church understand that Jesus died in our place for our sin debt? If they're fuzzy on this, or if it's felt that you need to do something in addition, they teach you need to do something in addition to be accepted by God, whether it's baptism or any other ritual, beware. That's not the truth. Does the church have a good reputation? Are the meetings known for being bizarre and disorderly? Um, do they have good moral standards, or, or even their business dealings. Are they doubtful, or are they above board? You should feel completely uh, free to ask these types of questions of any church leader. Um, any hedging on their part might be, uh, it should be seen as a, a cautionary signal. And then don't be caught up on how nice a, uh, a preacher might be, how persuasive he communicates. You have to know that many churches are not following the Bible today. It's, it's a sad, sad thing to say, but it's the truth. There is no perfect church, don't, don't get me wrong. But these questions are going to help you find a group of like-minded believers. The whole, the whole notion of going to church, uh, for some people, it could give you a hard time from your family and friends. What, you go to church? People ask you at work, what did you do on the weekend? I went to church. It's not popular at all these days. Your pride may want to come to the rescue, but just remember who is the source of pride. Who is the first one to be proud and be cast out? The devil. And seek out a group of believers anyway. And don't be ashamed. The idea of getting together for mutual strength was God's idea. 
it's important for your growth as a Christian to gather together with like-minded believers. Fellow believers can be a tremendous help in encouraging you in your spiritual journey. Music, it's also, it's a resource. King David wrote the first songs in, in, in the book of Psalms, and therefore encouraging our hearts. Since then, other believers have wrote excellent music, excellent lyrics, glorifying God. But again, be aware, there's both good and bad. You have to use the same discernment you have for picking a church and, and what you listen to as well. Um, based on what you've studied, determine whether the words are true or false, and God will help you. Tell others. There's another resource. How, how's that a res- how is telling others a resource for me? You'll be amazed. If you would tell other people what God's done in your life, he will do a miraculous work in you as well. Disciples went everywhere telling others about the good news. You can too. If you accept, you receive it. I don't know how you could be quiet. Better than the cure for cancer or, or COVID or AIDS or anything. It's encouraging to see friends come to that same understanding. They won't ever do that if you don't reach out to them. But remember, God's given people a free will, so you have to respect it. Be patient in your approach and sensitive to what you say. Don't cram things down their throats. The Bible tells us to be witnesses, not lawyers. A witness explains something. A lawyer argues and tries to convince. Another resource that we've already talked about is a future hope. The Bible says that one day Jesus will return to the earth. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or have died or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, I encourage each other with these words. This is a resource. This is the context of the reality of the life that you're living in. To take your focus from this world and to what this brief existence has been. I've known the Lord for over 30 years, and it seems like it's been three weeks. Right? This is all going to be just a little glimpse of a lifetime compared to eternity. And to know that Jesus is coming back, and any rejection and any anguish or pain that you suffer in this world is not even to be compared to what it's going to be like when you see him. Because that's reality. That's reality. What we live in is kind of reality. It's important. But it's just, it's just the, um, the preamble. It's just the opening act compared to the real uh, life, as it were. Eternity. Really, there's so much could be said if you're one of those who put your trust in Christ. Um, and it's good to know what the Bible says that God's going to lead you step by step. You've started a spiritual pilgrimage. If you keep your eyes on Him, that you're going you're gonna to stay focused. You're going to grow stronger and stronger. So, I got another section to go on to. But before I do, Brittany, I want to see if that helped anything that you were talking about before. There's a list of resources. Did that help? Okay, it was other people, the Bible, uh, just different things there. We can go over them uh, uh, afterwards as well. Um, if, you, if you made that decision and you're saying, now I understand, now I believe, now I am fully receiving Christ and trusting in him alone, uh, tell someone who's spiritually mature. That was the other thing, Brittany, I wanted to mention. Tell someone and then ask them for help on next steps. There's nothing better you can do than have someone. Jesus had 12 disciples. And having someone else help you makes a big difference, doesn't it? Right? Having someone else help you come alongside with you when you don't know what to do, it's huge. Okay? So that's the next thing I would suggest as well. Study your map, the Bible, regularly. Jason, you have a question? Distraction? Okay. The road will not always be smooth, but God will be with you. He's given you a promise for a good journey. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything, everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
But believe it or not, we're not done. So hold on, hold on, hold on for me because we have another section to go through. There are those who, after reading the Bible and even understanding it, uh, even after a class like this, um, they decide to take a risk. They decide not to believe it, not to really receive the message and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They choose to ignore its message as as not being applicable to them. I, I hear what you're saying, but that really doesn't apply to me. Or they just reject it outright. I don't care. I reject it. Or they just get busy with life and they forget it. Or they try to change its message. And they hope that the Bible is wrong. We're going to talk about some people who had similar reactions. One, one was named Herod Agrippa. He took that risk. He was the grandson of Herod the Great, the one who killed all the, the, the babies after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So Herod Agrippa was the, the grandson of Herod the Great and nephew of Herod Antipas. He must have been uh, aware of all the gossip about Jesus, as it would be flying around there in the royal household. The, the kings were very aware of what was going on in their, in their areas. And no doubt, spies reported every word that this prophet from Nazareth had said. But Herod had status. He was an important man. Rather than humble himself before the king of kings, he continued to live his life for himself. He even gained an element of popularity by beheading one of the apostles, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. But then, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. See, God, in his grace, he will be patient with sin for a while. But then his just, in his justice, he will judge it. He is gracious and patient, but he's not tolerant. His patience does end. Judgment may come in this life or may be withheld until after death, but it will happen. Herod died and faced eternity in the lake of fire. But the next verse is very interesting. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. You see, this king thought he had won by beheading one of the apostles and then he was in eternity himself and the word of God keeps going on. I would encourage you not to casually ignore the Bible's message as being not applicable to you. Don't become too busy to properly investigate it. It'd be a tragedy not to have taken the time to really discover all you needed to know about life and death. There was another contemporary of Jesus His name was Herod Agrippa II. As the grandson of Herod the Great and son of Herod Agrippa, he would also have known about Jesus. The Bible says King Agrippa was well-versed in all things concerning Jesus. The apostle Paul was arrested and testified before him, before Agrippa II. In his defense, before Agrippa II, Paul told, told him all about Jesus. He said, For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Since this thing thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. See, King Agrippa seemed to understand Paul quite well. So much so he even had to admit that Paul almost persuaded him to become a Christian. But Agrippa took the risk. He didn't believe. He sidestepped the question in an effort to avoid making a decision. As far as we know, Agrippa never did believe. He went to his grave understanding here, but not believing, not receiving Jesus as his Lord and Savior. It was his choice. Paul also defended himself before a Roman governor named Felix. Paul always took these opportunities to give a lengthy explanation of who Jesus was and what he had done. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. 
See, Felix put off the decision. He was waiting for a more convenient time. It's easy to do that, but the problem is there's never a convenient time to follow Christ. It is never a convenient time. We never know what the future is going to hold. Felix put off this decision, but he was waiting for that convenient time. The Bible says this, now is the accepted time. Now, today is the day of salvation. You never know what the future is going to bring, how quickly our lives can be taken. I'm glad to be 51. My dad died at 44. Right before I became a Christian at 18, our class valedictorian at 17 died in high school, months before we graduated. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We need to decide now. Of course, Felix was afraid, and sometimes we become fearful too. We wonder what others may think. You know, it really doesn't matter what others think. It only matters what God thinks. History doesn't record what happened to Felix. To the best of our knowledge, he never did find a convenient time. Felix also had other hopes, though. He was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe, so he sent for him frequently and talked with him. See, Felix had ulterior, ulterior motives. His professed interest in Jesus was distorted by his desire for money. Nevertheless, he did speak often with Paul about Jesus. You could have seen that as being him being religion, religious or gotten religion. Some people are like Felix. They talk a lot about the Bible, but they use its message for profit. Most people recognize the inconsistency, but some are deceived. Because of such hypocrites, some people claim they will never believe the Bible. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did the Bible's message change? Not one bit. It stays the same no matter what people do to distort it. If you're one of those ones who are tempted to reject the Bible's message um, because of guys like Felix and other hypocrites, then think again. If you find yourself vacillating or not understanding or just outright rejecting what you've read, then I might suggest you investigate the Bible a little bit more. Don't stop now. Don't stop now. If you don't have perfect peace, don't stop now. What we've done is a chronological teaching on the gospel from Genesis all the way through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You have all the facts. Now, I will say that many people struggle along those ways, not with the facts as the Bible teaches them, but with their own hearts and grasping and receiving it. So there's many people here at Hillview Bible Chapel that are trained in what's called the gospel outline. And they can take you on a summary kind of review. <laughs> and it doesn't take weeks. It just takes hours, an hour or two maybe. Okay? But it goes to the gospel outline, and it shows you, and you can stop and ask and interact with more questions. So if you don't have perfect peace, like in these questions I asked you, like you know where you're going to go and why, I highly recommend you get a hold of myself or someone else here who knows the gospel outline and can share it with you and share the gospel we call it an outline because this is a very full version. The outline, it's more condensed, but it hits all the major important parts. And that's why now that you have the background, you can more quickly and understandably go through a gospel outline with somebody. I would highly recommend it. Don't stop now. As we said at the beginning, the scripture does, not, it does have a lot to say about life and about death. Don't stop now in your investigation. Your life and your life after death is at stake. Okay, if you can indulge me on our last night with a few questions. And we'll go quickly. Let's start with this backwards. Janice, can you read this one for us? It is true. It is true. Very good. Jesus is coming again. So sure as he came the first time, he's coming back. This time he's not coming back for, to go to a cross. He's coming back to rule uh, over the world. Larry, can you read this one for us? Paul says, uh, if you reject the death, you will go to hell. Go ahead and read, read all of them.
Yeah, no, that's absolutely, absolutely right. That's why studying this is so important. Once you understand this message of the cross, the rest of the Bible unfolds. It all, it all revolves around that, literally. Okay, good. Grace, you read this for us? true yep there's your paragraph summary probably for the whole class takes you a lot to get there thanks how about this one cameron that's right that's true as well good okay gee how about this one That's right, it is false. The same cross that brings you into relationship with God is the same cross that you go to for forgiveness as a child of God. Yeah, that's right, good. All right, Christian, you got this one? I, I just picked a bit at random. I don't know why the hard one shows, shows, up, shows up with you. So it's a relationship in both lines? Okay, anybody else? Jason's back there shaking his head. What do you think, Jason? The first one is relationship. You're right. The relationship is fixed. That cannot be altered. You cannot unborn a child. I'm waiting for someone else here, Janice. Hold on. Anybody else? Natalie? Yeah, fellowship. Fellowship. I've said to my loved ones plenty of times, I love you. I might not like you right now, but I love you. We have a relationship, right? I love them. I choose to love them. We have a relationship. The fellowship isn't so great, right? That's the, that's the difference there, Okay. Relationship is established once and for all. Fellowship is much more tenuous. It needs to be restored. Good. Annie, you got this one? Close. Veronica? Ah, close. Matt? What's that? By the fruit he, he maintains? How about you, Natalie? Close. Wow. This is a hard one. Any suggestions, Brittany? How about you, Larry? That's right, by the focus. And we talked about that. Whatever you focus on, you focus on yourself, you're going to become what? Self-centered. You focus on the Lord, you're going to become like him. Right? Good. What are the things we are to focus on? Which of these, Andy? A, B, and C? How about D? Sticking with A, B, and C. That's right. Very good. Good job. Thank you, Veronica. You want to read this for us? Preoccupied. 
preoccupation, preoccupation. D, it's all three. Yeah, you got a lot of enemies, and they're powerful, but they're not more powerful than, than who's in you. Good. All right, Matt, can you read this for us? Yeah, that's it. That's the way we're born. What's that baby say when it's first born? Mine. Right? Okay, Nally? You would? It's close, very close. And knowing God and serving. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. It's been a little bit of a theme here, Brittany. What do you think? Close. That's right. They end up becoming synonymous, right? Yeah, it's not just thing you just thing you think in your head, it's the thing you were actually focusing on. Very good. Good. Did I skip you, Gia? Yeah, can you just nail all those real quick? Chris, you're next, so be ready. And all you guys. (laughs) Uh, close. See any other ones down there? Yeah, so there's one that we're down. This is the truth. That you, you don't have bad ones. It's probably the second to last one, right? And dwells us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Right, that's that's a true. It's a reality. It's an amazing reality. God comes inside a person. Uh, it calls it the mystery. Of what is was an ages past now revealed. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's just an incredible truth. Okay, Chris, you got the next one. Right? No, oh, I'm sorry. I was talking about that, Chris, back there. You're off the hook for now. Very good, very good. That's how you walk with God, by faith. You don't start a relationship with God by faith and, and, and by faith and try to keep that relationship by works or effort or, you know. No, it's not like that. You walk by faith as well. Okay, the Bible. What do you think, Larry? Well, that's true. That's not what the Bible is on this one. At least what I mentioned. That's right. That's exactly it. If you want to be strong, if you want to grow up from being kids or not go hungry in the middle of the day, you have to eat, right? If you want to be strong spiritually, you have to feed on the Bible, God's word. Good. Prayer. What's that, Janice? Simply talking to God. That's it. Simply talking to God. Like someone asked my wife that the other day. She says, just talking to God. We have it here, Cameron, telling others. close. It's true. Another example of telling others that's up there. You wouldn't be here right now if people didn't do this. You would not be here now. I wouldn't be here now. Someone else shared with people who shared with you. Music, Grace. Yeah, it can. It can be really powerful, actually. Good. And the last two, Christian, look at that. (laughs) 
That's it. Looks like an LA roadmap, but you guys nailed them. Good job. Okay. Good job. Very good. All right, last few. Andy, read it for us, please. It is. It's true. Don't think it's going to be undealt with. God will deal with it. He doesn't miss it at all. Brock, could you read that for us? Okay, it's good. That's right. The Bible's message never changed. Never changes. Anybody else? Be too. Yeah. We never know what the future may hold. God is the consummate gentleman. He doesn't make anybody do anything. If people want to live their own life and turn away from him, he says, okay, but this is my heaven. If you want to live your life, you wouldn't even want to be in heaven with God. Okay. But once you turn to him in faith and become his child, then you would want to be. So he never forces himself on anyone. Okay. Thank you very much. Hope to see you guys soon, maybe in a week if that works out. Um, one thing I want to do right now that I haven't done the whole class time uh, with you personally, but I have been not with you guys present, but been praying for you guys. So I want to close this in prayer. Lord, I do want to thank you. Thank you for all that have joined, both on Zoom and in person here. Lord, I thank you for their uh, diligence and wanting to know your word. Lord, you know where each one is at. You know if each one is truly in a relationship with you or not, uh, a life-changing, a uh, fully trusting relationship where you've come and in, in dwelling inside them. For each one that has really truly received you, uh, I pray they would uh, grow. They would not remain spiritual babes. They would take all these resources we've talked about and all these uh, uh, things that you've given them and they would take full advantage of them and they would grow in you, Lord Jesus. And they would be bear fruit and mature uh, in their relationship with you, coming to know you, being in the word, finding a good church to go to and also mature believers who they can talk to and get help from. Uh, Lord, for those who are uh, on the fence or believe these things don't apply to them, Lord, I pray you'd speak to their hearts. I pray they wouldn't give up. I pray they would continue to seek you, to have their eyes opened, to see how they do apply, and that you would uh, speak to their hearts. I pray they, they wouldn't stop now, and that you would use uh, this as just the beginning uh, of a spiritual journey for them, and that they wouldn't stop until they have full assurance of, of peace with God. Lord, we thank you for... These 16 weeks and all that we've gone through, all the, the, the challenges and trials, and uh, pray you would bless uh, these folks uh, for your glory. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.